God bless you all in Jesus name. Uh, we're trying to get used to some different equipment we started using today. Uh, but so help us God, we're going to get through it and it's going to be a blessing for everyone. Uh, we're starting with the family seminar. Um, and every year between um, the months of September and December, we have um, we dedicate those very last uh, months of the year to the family and as a family seminar uh, we base it completely on a Christian family and we use a lot of um, the book of Ephesians in fact we do study the book of Ephesians practically verse by verse and chapter after chapter we do include a few other passages of the Bible and we then you know um, try and get as much information as possible so that it will help us you know um, uh, make the foundation of a Christian family we've um, <clears throat> we have throughout the centuries you know seen the development of of the Christian family and though we will start with a few verses on the book of Ephesians we will visit back to the very beginning of the Bible when God created men and women and we will see that the person that instituted that created this institution which is the human family was in fact our God, our Creator, our Lord. <clears throat> and we'll look at the development throughout the centuries. You know, uh, how did the modern family come about? And many aspects of this family today. Though we will focus mainly on Christianity or Christianity as a basis, um, we will see that it is impossible to have a Christian family without the most important person, which is Christ. And perhaps we should start there. You know, what is the word Christ? The word Christ um, <clears throat> comes from a Greek word, word called Christos, which means anointed. But why was he anointed? Why is this anointing such in, of such importance? And it brings back to the original Hebrew, which is the word Mashiach, which is anointed, which means anointed to be king. So the anointing that Christ received, and we see it through the promises throughout the Bible. You know, this, uh, this anointing is so important for us today more than any other day if you allow me just uh, one second i need to make a small adjustment Yes, so sorry about that, but we needed to increase a little bit the quality of the sound. Um, yes, yeah, so he is anointed to be king. He is anointed to be our king, to be our savior. And through him, we found salvation. And when Christ came to the world, he based his teaching solely on the Bible, on the Torah. The word Torah means instruction. You know, in fact, uh, God left us a set of instructions, the Bible per se, so that we can follow it. And the whole Bible is based on the uh, most important commandment for, for the Jews, which is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, which means, listen, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only God, it's the only one. And you shall love your God with all your heart and all your might and all your spirit. And 
Jesus brought it, you know, to us, extending this commandment. And he says that the whole set of instructions that God left us, the Torah, is based on two fundamental commandments, being the first one, to love your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your spirit. And the second one, which is as important as the first, to love thy neighbor as thyself. So Christianity is based on the commandments of love. If you Google it, you will see Google or Wikipedia or many of these search engines and online encyclopedias, they have the same definition, that Christianity is a religion based on love. God's love, our love, a love, you know, that surpasses the understanding of lust and passion. But it's more eternal, more fraternal, if one can say so. And it, it is in this love that we base the seminar or this, you know, teaching, Bible study about the family. Though we could be going back and forth through, through many uh, points of this letter that Paul writes to the Ephesians. And why the Ephesians? You know, why did Paul take this point of view towards them? Because Ephesus, as a city, uh, back in its day, was pretty much like a great, one of the greatest cities in the world today, like London or New York or Johannesburg or, uh, uh, you know, uh, Paris, with diversity and many business practices, many religions, many cultures. It was an economic hub for the era. And when you have this, you know, many traditions and many backgrounds, it is important for us to maintain, you know, the teachings of Christ more vivid, more um, <clears throat> into practice, if I, if I can, for the lack of a better word at the moment. So we need to practice Christianity. So it is impossible to have a Christian family without Christ. Or we, and first, what we will understand is that, you know, on the first few chapters of the letter that Paul writes, writes to the Ephesians, you will find that it's, it's got a very general basis. And Paul introduces many ideas about Christianity and what it is to be a Christian. And when doing so, you know, towards the, the latter part of the, of the, uh, uh, the, the epistle that Paul writes, we will find that it takes a more practical approach. So we will, in fact, you know, uh, like any course, we will study the theory, perhaps in the beginning, and the concept of salvation and what it is to be a Christian, you know, uh, is it just a physical thing? Is it a set of rules? Yes, there are sets of rules that we need to follow. They are very important. Uh, God is a very organized God. Um, that's why he left us this Bible, this set of instructions, and he calls it, in fact, the word instruction, which is the Torah. You know, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Uh, which means thy, thy Torah, you know, is, is a lamp. So it shines light. It sheds light and it brightens up the situations. And when the light of God shines uh, over a surface, then we will be able to identify what we're dealing with. So it will require from you and me and all of us that we look at it from a very humble uh, point of view so that um, we can then absorb this teaching. It is impossible to teach someone that knows everything. So to those that know everything, unfortunately, the seminar isn't for you. But if, if um, one is willing to take an honest approach, 
and look at one's life objectively, then yes, then this is definitely for you or me, for those who want to improve their family lives, their relationships, especially now more than ever, since we experienced this lockdown, we, you know, we are faced with our spouses on a day-to-day -day basis. You can see both my wife and I work from this office during the day. We have our daily activities, our daily jobs. We share this workspace very closely. And I wouldn't say it's a challenge. To me, it's a blessing because I can look at a beautiful face every now and then. Uh, but for other couples, it might be a challenge because you are up in each other's faces all the time. So let's then pay attention to the Word of God. Enough about this introduction. Um, and we will dive into the Word of God. And let's look at right, right from the beginning. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Uh, Genesis chapter... One, And let's start there, right in the beginning. Amen. The Word of God says here, when God created man, we will just find it for you. Uh, let's see. Uh, seas, the living creatures. Okay, verse 27. So God created man in his own image created him, male and female, created he them. So what does it mean to be created in God's image? And, you know, one of the fundamental um, Ten Commandments is thou shalt not make an image for you out of anything in the skies, on the earth, or below the earth, in the seas. Why are we not allowed to have these images? Why are we not allowed to create an image uh, to worship? It's purely because we were made in God's image. God left this awesome image of himself. When we look at another human being, we should be looking at God's ultimate creation. The very thing that proves that God exists is us, humans. God made man. God made the word man or human is Adam. You know, and he made this Adam, this man, from the, from the earth and he blessed him. And it's amazing. God blesses men. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. You know, and it's amazing. God created man and gave this dominion to man. Then on the second chapter of um of uh, Genesis, something interesting happens. And you know, you might say, how did God create men and women, you know, in his image? And thereafter, you know, um, where was the woman? Because you come to chapter 2, and, and you know, and you see that Eve wasn't there. You know, and it's quite interesting. I was looking at some rabbinical commentaries. Is that because women... The woman was already inside the man, and we will see that. Um, <clears throat> on verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So, first of all, we don't have a soul. It's very important to understand this that many people make a separation and they say that we are three, we are body, soul, and spirit. But the word of God says clearly that God placed inside of us his breath, 
the very part of himself and we became a living soul, something alive, something as alive as God is alive, you know, because he made us in his image. So you may say, what does God look like? I would say God looks like you and God looks like me and God looks like all of us because the Bible doesn't lie. Amen. Um, and we became this living soul, which is the most amazing thing. We became this powerful spiritual being, men made in God's image, filled with God's strength and power and knowledge. And, you know, and it's, I, I find it, you know, absolutely amazing. And a little bit further, when we look at chapter at verse 18 of the same chapter, the chapter 2. The word of God says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help, meet for him. So here we are. So on verse 1, it say, on chapter 1, it says that God formed men and women. Uh, and because the woman, as we will see here, and it will be explained, she was already part of man, for we are one. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was in the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field, but for Adam, there was not found a help for him, a help that was dignified. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So that is why on chapter 1, God made male and female. Because we were part of the same DNA structure, the same carbon-based life form created from the ground. It's quite a scientific thing. When we analyze it from a scientific point of view, we live in a world which is, you know, made out of carbon-based life forms, which we are part of. And, and here we are, and God made this woman. And when Adam wakes up, he sees the most beautiful woman on the face of the planet. Not because she was the only one at the time, but because God made her perfect. Amen? And there are many ideas about woman. And God identified that it would be not good for Adam to be alone. So it wasn't my choice or your choice. God knows everything and he knows best. And it is not good for men to be alone. You leave men alone and, it, and they're going to get up to mischief and to problems will happen. So here we have the second human being an upgraded version of the first one, I would say. You know, um, a human that's faster, thinks a lot faster, speaks a lot faster, um, is able to multitask uh, better, and but like any upgrade, you know, there are, uh, and we see this even with cell phones today, the next generation of cell phones might be faster and might be stronger in a, from a certain point of view, but they are also more fragile. You know, if you look back at the first cell phones that came out, there was the famous Nokia 3310. That thing could fall from a 10-story building and not break. You know, today, our cell phones, if they fall into a very smooth carpet, they're bound to break. 
So yes, so the woman is faster and more beautiful and better in many things, but she, you know, she is still, um, I would say a more fragile uh, human, more emotional at times, and, but better, you know, someone we need to hear, someone that we as men need to pay attention to and hear and take care of. And, you know, I, I'm not, uh, I would say, um, by no means I am a, a male chauvinistic. I think that it, it, is, it is detrimental for men to think they can be better than women. I think women are far better than men in many aspects especially because they are the only humans that can make other humans. You know, they are the only human beings that are able to form other humans as God did. And in many aspects, the woman is more spiritual than a man and more attuned to the spiritual world, to the Creator as such. So here we have it. Adam looks at this woman and then, you know, something beautiful happens. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. So here it is. That's how God created male and female on chapter one, because the woman was within the man. And here and here she is. And it's amazing that, you know, when we fall in love, it's like when we wake up from a slumber, we, we wake up and we see this most beautiful human and we say, she is my woman. She is made out of, bone, out of bones of my bones and flesh out of my flesh. And she came out of me and she is, you know, it's, she is part of me. And, and God then, he, he makes a ruling, which is possibly one of the most important. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh and they were both naked the man and his wife and were not ashamed because they were living in a full state of grace at the time so here we have it you know a man shall leave his father and mother so it's it's a new phase of his life you know where you know, you start figuring out things, you know, between the couple. And then and, and it's a completely different person that comes into one's life. And not only we need to adapt, but we need to grow together because there will be a family. And we shall be one flesh. And this one flesh is, in fact, the act of, you know, um, of coupling when we have this sexual relationship uh, uh, you know we become one we become intimate we become we become you know part of another person both from a physical physical point of view and a spiritual point of view you know that is why we talk about sex uh, from a very important perspective which is much a, a, a higher plane if, if you want to call it is we link up to that person at a spiritual level much higher than the world below because it is a spiritual connection for we are spiritual beings we are um, a living soul as the Bible calls us. So here we have it. You know, uh, lesson number one on this, on this uh, teaching is that we are linked at a spiritual level, made in God's image, you know, uh, to rule the world that we live in. So here we have it. So where does Paul come in with the book of Ephesians? In a much modern time, a few thousand years later, uh, Paul then writes to the church, to the Jews, the love in Ephesus, you know, uh, in, this, in this form. And, and he tells them, 
Grace be to you and peace from, our, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, spiritual blessings, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ. So, so here we are, you know, and I see many churches today, many communities, uh, many people, they try and preach a gospel of financial blessing or a prosperity gospel per se. I don't like to call it that because I see prosperity and blessing at a much higher plane as Paul sees it here. And, you know, we are being fed these lies about, about the gospel, which is only from a financial point of view, which is really isn't. We don't need any more blessings than what we already have because we have all the blessings we need. We were made in God's image. God gave us this dominion and power. And Paul writes to tell us that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. But these spiritual blessings, they are not residing on this earth. They reside in heavenly places and then in the person of Christ Jesus, the person who atoned our sins. You know, where we find the atonement of our sins, the forgiveness of our sins, you know, through the blood of Christ. This ultimate sacrifice that God gave us. So then, yes, it, it aligns with um, Genesis chapter 1. Because we were made in God's image. We were made not physically, but both spiritually. And God had given this dominion, this blessing, this power to Adam, which of course we know he lost in the process because of, you know, of sin. But now, through Christ Jesus, we are able to get it back. And we are able to apply these blessings to our lives to live a new reality in Christ Jesus according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So it is God's plan that we are here today. It is God's plan because he predestined, it was a predestination. You accept that destination if you want to. But I can assure you that we have been blessed and we are blessed and we are a blessing in Christ Jesus through the atonement of our sins and and that has a holistic approach and and it encompasses all of the areas of our lives not just a physical or material area but a spiritual psychological um, uh, you can even say bringing about mental health to our daily activities to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted and in the beloved, which is Christ Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace. Again, talking about a spiritual treasure, which is in fact the very grace of God. We didn't deserve it. But he gave it to us. And it's in him. In this, you know, made pretty much like Adam and Eve was made. In God's awesome grace. Here we have it. We have the ability to be better. To be filled with grace. To, you know, uh, impact our daily lives with such blessings. 
And this is what it's expected of us as Christians to love, you know, in this very, very powerful manner. Wherein he hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence, have he made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. So here in verse 9, we start dealing with a very interesting subject. What is the mystery of God's will? What is God thinking? And it is a mystery. You know, can we know what God wants? Is it possible that he could reveal us this mystery of God's will? You know, and we will study this, this letter that Paul writes. You know, and, and we see so many scholars trying to study the Bible and trying to decipher God's will. And they try and do it by, you know, uh, from a very intellectual point of view. And they fail because you cannot try and explain God. It's, 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 like, an, it's like a small insect trying to explain a human being. You know, it's impossible. So it has to be done at the same level that God is. And God is, God is in, he's spiritual. And he gave us part of himself. And that's why when we link up with God at that spiritual level, then we believe and we are made known of the thoughts of God. It's the most amazing thing. Um, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. So the mystery of God's will is that He is bringing us all into this oneness. You know, this, the Hebrew word for, for oneness is echad. And it's uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 6 when it says, The Lord your God, listen, O Israel, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad which means, listen, Israel, the Lord your God is the only one. But is in the unity, the word Ehad, it's not in its uh, singular form, and it's in its plural form, which is the most amazing thing, because it's in Him, Christ Jesus. You know, it talks about this unity that God is, and, and we become one in Him, one in God, one with God. It's very powerful. Jesus talks about that. You know, uh, you are the branches, I am the true vine. We are linked together by God himself, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be the be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So here talks about this ultimate promise. You know, the promise of marriage which will take us you know to possibly the next lesson I don't want to exhaust our time today but you know the, it's very interesting on in Jewish tradition how marriage works and and there is a thing which you know in in modern times I'm talking about the New Testament times they call it the letter of divorce but in fact it was something, you know, that was given to the wife upon, you know, the promise of marriage. And, and, and this thing is called ketubah, which is in fact meaning the written thing. You know, it was a written document that would specify, and we see this in the case of 
um, when Abraham sends his servant to find a wife for, 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 for Isaac. And thereafter, you know, uh, Jacob works a certain uh, uh, journal of, of years. You know, he journeys through these years to, to settle the debt of marrying both of his wives, you know, uh, Rachel and, 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 and Leah. And, and this written thing is, in fact, the price that the husbandman pays, you know, to be the husband, not to buy a woman as a thing that is bought, but it's a term of responsibility. And God, uh, in, in the form of Christ Jesus, on John chapter 14, and the whole of John chapter 14 is in fact a written thing, a written promise when, when Jesus then promises us housing. I shall go and bode you a place. That is typical marriage proposal. So you can't marry a woman without a house. Where are you going to put her? In the street? No, you're going to make a house. So then John chapter 14, I shall bode you houses. I shall make a place for us. So that wherever I am, there you shall be. And then ultimately, he then gives us the promise of this Holy Spirit. And I will call upon him. The Holy Spirit will be with you forever. Forever you will be part of the Spirit of God. Forever you will be linked spiritual as Adam was linked with God. Through his spirit, through his Ruach Kodesh, which is the Holy Spirit, this holy breath of life. So we are linked unto God, which is the earnest of your inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. So we are dealing with the ultimate gift, the ultimate wedding ring, the ultimate marriage proposal, a spiritual one, one that's made in the heavens, but not to a single person, but to a, a holy body. That's why the church is called the body of Christ. That's why the church is called the bride of Christ. That's why throughout you know, uh, uh, history in the Bible, God always refers to his people as his wife. Because it's that relationship that we're dealing with. So all these aspects will fall into place during the course of our seminar. But where I want to get with you up to here on, on chapter 5, on, on verse 15 of chapter 1, is that this is very, very much a spiritual um, gathering in Christ Jesus. You know, a, a spiritual marriage, pretty much like the one that Adam had with Eve. And how will it impact us? It impacts us because we need to be responsible for this spiritual, spiritual power that God has given us, these spiritual uh, possessions. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And God writes, you know, and Paul writes to them because the testimony of their actions were vivid, were real. You know, they were testifying through their actions the, the power of their Christianity. It is a way of life. It's much higher than a simple set of rules made by man, but it is a spiritual gathering. It's we're joining with the oneness of God. And that's where this, you know, family seminar is based upon upon these teachings of spiritual blessings. So we will end our lesson here today and we'll carry on from verse 15 next week. And let me tell you, 
we are not in a hurry to finish the letter of Ephesians. We will take it as it comes, verse by verse. We're going to explore it extensively. We will travel through the Bible and to the many different examples we have of families. And in doing so, I pray unto God that your family may be blessed, that um, your communion with your husband or your wife and your children, how you behave at home, how you deal with one another's, um, you know, um, uh, let's say, emotional uprisings, you know, all of that gets gathered together. And it is very important that we never forget that it's in Christ Jesus that we have our Christian family. It is in God himself that we were made in his image. And it's so important that you never forget where you came from. That you never forget that you came from God. And when, when you look at your husband, I want you to, when, when you look at your wife, when you look at your children, when you look at your parents, uh, you know, you need to see God because they were made in God's image. May God bless you all. May His grace shine upon you. May the communion of the Holy Spirit fill your lives. May you all be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.